All right, welcome back to Network Information Hiding Chapter 6 is what we deal with today. Uh, it's sophisticated and distributed hiding methods and patterns. Um, let's first look at the idea of pattern variation. Pattern variation is what we proposed in 2015. So you already know what patterns are. Uh, if not, have a look at Chapter 4 uh, and 5. So the, um, the idea is that one pattern describes how we can hide data. And however, we can apply a pattern to different network protocols. So we change the context of where we apply the pattern. And then we need some um, implementation details for a specific protocol. Let us assume this would be IP version 4, this would be IP version 6. Then um, and we would perform some data hiding in the least significant bit of the TTL in IP version 4 and want to apply this to the hop, hop limit or hop count in IP version 6, which is essentially the same functionality. Um, what we would need then is a size of the header field, the location in the header, so the offset from the start of the header and things like um, the byte order. And then we can simply apply one pattern from one protocol to another. And this is how pattern variation works. So um, this allows um, also to switch between protocols. Independent of the pattern variation or patterns at all, there are two um, ideas that I want to show you. Um, one is, uh, and both belong to the domain of protocol switching covert channels. Um, one is the protocol hopping covert channel where we switch between protocols and you can do this with pattern variation, but you don't need to. You do not need to apply the same pattern to different protocols. You can also mix patterns here um, where you embed um, your secret message. For instance, here the hello world and different protocols. So you send the HE with the HTTP protocol and then you send two ICMP packets with some part of the string and then again an HTTP packet. So this is a protocol hopping covert channel. The protocol channel or sometimes also use, named the protocol switching covert channel, which is a bit problematic because the protocol hopping covert channel is also a type of protocol switching covert channel. So I will speak of protocol channel here. Um, does it in a different way. Here, you, we do not embed information in the, um, in, the, in the packets themselves in a way that um, we, we use some reserve bits or something, but instead we let the protocol itself represent the hidden information. So if a DNS packet occurs, then for instance, it could be the, the binary message 1.0. And if it's an SSH packet, then it could be 0.1, for instance, and so forth. So if we have four protocols, we can have two um, bits per protocol that we send. And this way um, we can also transfer a secret message. Now, if we go back to the idea of patterns, I spoke about pattern variation where we apply the same pattern to different protocols, but we can also perform pattern hopping, which is like a combination of pattern variation with protocol switching covert channels uh, of both types. So what we do is for every new secret message that we send, we let the random number generator or pseudo random number generator PRNG choose a pattern. And that pattern is then used to transfer the next message. So for instance, we can first use the sequence modulation, then the size modulation, then PDU order, then inter-arrival times, and then maybe again PDU order, and then maybe again sequence modulation, and then maybe again sequence modulation, whatever the pseudo-random number generator decides. Um, and then this can also, however, be applied to different protocols. So you can perform pattern hopping with the same protocol, but also with different protocols. So you mix patterns and protocols. This is also feasible. So what I've shown you so far are these three ideas introduced in 2015 and earlier. And, um, but 
there are more forms of so-called pattern-based distributed covert channel real realization or distributed hiding methods. What we also can do is pattern combination on the special domain distribution. This means uh, we have multiple patterns and they are applied to the same packet. For instance, if we perform a size modulation of an IP version 4 packet plus a value modulation of the TTL field in that packet, then we apply two patterns to the same packet. That leaves much more space for that hiding data. Um, another thing is pattern hopping that I already described. So we have different patterns applied to, to succeeding network packets. And then we have pattern variation of which we um, can draw three subtypes. Um, I've shown you only the protocol-based scattering and this is now a fine, granular, more advanced and more recent version of how pattern variation can be understood. So first of all, we have host-based scattering. Um, we have the same pattern, but we apply to different, different network, network addresses. For instance, one host with multiple IP addresses and um, the hidden information uh, can be then encoded using different um, hosts. We can also split the information over different flows. So we still have the same pattern, but we apply it to different flows. And with protocol-based scattering, we also have the same pattern, but applied to different network protocols. This would be a protocol hopping covert channel that always uses the same pattern. However, we can combine these things. So we can perform pattern hopping and pattern variation and pattern combination all together and um, then hide more data within a packet because of pattern combination. We can perform pattern variation because we switch between different protocols for the same pattern, but we can also switch between the patterns using pattern hopping. Um, so using a pseudo-random number generator, um, this can be done easily. And there are also proof, proof of concept codes available. Look um, up these references. Uh, the figure is from the paper towards deriving insights into data hiding methods using pattern-based approach from um, summer 2018. And um, in this paper, we reference more work and more proof of concept codes that you can download. Um, PHCCT and PSCC are written by myself, they are available on my website and on GitHub. Okay, next idea. This is a very important idea. Uh, network environment learning. Short form is NEL. Um, a NEL allows a COVID channel node to determine how filters in the network environment are configured by probing several COVID channel techniques. So if we have a covert sender that wants to send data to a receiver, then sometimes there's a filter, a traffic normalizer or a firewall or something like that in between. And um, maybe this filter drops covert channel packets. So what the covert sender and the receiver want to know is which packets are dropped and which are not. And the first approach to do this and where also the term NEL was coined, was um, published by Jaroszkin et al. in 2008. Um, and they foresee a constant process where both um, hosts send and record the traffic that, is, um, that, they, uh, that they receive. And uh, so they determine which protocols are potentially non-blocked. This is a constant process because the normalizer can change its rules over time for the firewall because the administrator could change its configuration. However, um, this is not a, the best solution uh, to perform a NEL. I improved this um, using an intermediate node where the covert sender, sender announces that he he will send um, test traffic uh, to the receiver. So the sender 
tells the intermediate node, hey, um, I will now send the following test packets. And the intermediate node will forward this announcement to the receiver. And the receiver now waits for the test traffic. And the covert sender then sends the test traffic. And the, um, uh, the sender sends the test traffic and the receiver will then provide feedback over the intermediate node back to the covert sender and then they know exactly um, which packets go through because um, if the covert sender would just like here send traffic then the covert sender would optimally report back to the covert sender which packets go through but if the um, firewall or traffic normalizer blocks the message um, from the receiver to the sender, so the feedback message, then the covert sender does not know which message arrived. This is a so-called two-army problem, because the covert sender doesn't know whether the message got dropped between um, him and the receiver or between the receiver and him. So uh, that's that's a problem that can only be solved um, with the intermediate node, which is only used as a temporary node. Um, it will be removed later but it can be a public node, for instance, Google Translator or something like that. So if uh, the covert sender lets some URL on the covert receiver, uh, lets it translate by the um, intermediate node, which would be the Google Translator, then it can pass some parameters over the URL, for instance. So this works uh, without having the intermediate node being aware of the covert channel or actually uh, providing any covert channel functionality. So um, the NAL driven communication uh, process for the covert channel cannot be blocked unless all covert, channel covert channels used between covert sender and receiver are blocked. So let's say they support 50 covert channels, then um, they all need to be blocked because sooner or later they will determine um, uh, which covert channels are um, non-blocked by the firewall. I will also add to the slides the link to the proof of concept code that I wrote and that we used also to perform experiments for several papers. It's available on GitHub as open source and you can use it to play around with the code and, um, and, and also use it for your own research if you want. What can be done also in a similar way is dynamic overlay routing for covert channels. This was first introduced in 2008 by Cipierski et al. They had, a, I think, a random walk based overlay routing. So um, this is a figure of the paper by Bax et al. But the idea is essentially the same, just using different protocols. The idea is you have covert channel nodes um, here they are called agents or peers and they want to communicate but um, for instance in between them is a firewall like in the in the network environment learning or NEL scenario that I discussed on the previous slide so they want to find some communication path to have uh, to realize communication between them so they exploit some nodes called drones like Google Translator or something like that to bypass filters like the firewall and because the underlying network that they exploit for this can change because firewall rules can change or uh, links can be uh, broken or things like that they use dynamic routing to uh, optimize the data transfer between them and to react to um, changed filter rules this can also be used, as we have shown, to perform a quality of service for covert channel overlay networks. And what you need to do to realize something like that is to add a so-called control or micro protocol into the covert channel, because this is a dynamic routing protocol inside the covert channel. Uh, one of my students realized this uh, with the open short path, uh, open shortest path first, OSPF like um, routing protocol in 2012. Uh, in the same paper, I also show, um, I added some of my work where we um, um, 
have shown how to shrink the size of such a routing protocol. Uh, anyway, the point is this allows highly sophisticated functionality for covert channel networks and can also be uh, used in a botnet scenario. So um, it was also interesting to study how this can be done then and then to um, study how this can be detected. But detection, I will discuss detection in a later chapter. Um, so, as mentioned, if you want some sophisticated features like network environment learning or covert channel overlay routing or something like that, then you need to design a covert channel internal control protocol, sometimes also called micro protocol. The earliest one I found was Ping Tunnel, published 2004. There's also work by De Graaf in 2005 and Ray and Mishra in 2008 and work by myself and by others. Here's a survey. If you click on this link, you should get access to the survey paper where we surveyed several COVID channel and kernel internal control protocols and compared them. Um, so what can they do? They can perform a reliable data transfer because if packets got lost, they can resend it because they can add something like a sequence number or things like that. They can allow you to have session and session management. They can perform overlay network addressing and based on that overlay routing. They can perform upgrades of the covert channel overlay, for instance, software upgrades of the, um, of the software that, that realizes the covert channel. They can have peer discovery to detect other nodes, other covert channel communicators and the overlay. They can switch the utilized network protocol also the pattern, etc. Um, but this paper was written before patterns were proposed, so um, this is still talking only about network protocols, but you already know there's more to know because of the distributed hiding methods. And they can react to uh, network configuration changes using the NEL phase, etc. There are formal approaches for designing control protocols. Uh, in order to optimize their uh, design and uh, their stealthiness. And I will cover this in this chapter. But there are also countermeasures specifically for control protocols. Check this paper, for instance, where um, we describe the categories of um, countermeasures um, on such protocols and how we attack existing control protocols, also how they can be improved. I think this is an open access paper, so you need no access to that. Just click on the link. Um, anyway, let's go back to the core idea here of a control protocol. Um, different control protocols for covert channels exist, and if they, if you want to evaluate them, then there are certain factors that you can use, for instance, their features, but also how the header is optimized for hiding. I will discuss this later. And how many features they can uh, transfer per bit. So it, let's say they have three features, and but they need 30 bits for that. That's, that's a lot. If you need to store 30 covert channel bits in a network packet, then that's a lot. So they need to be space efficiency. Also, um, another um evaluation criteria is whether they are upgradable if they support different versions and if they can handle and react to non covert input if they are robust uh, more aspects are in the paper so let us assume you have a network protocol this could be the ip version 4 header for instance now from this header you can um exploit some bits to, um, if you have a storage meter method, of course, if you use a covert storage pattern, um, hiding pattern, then you can insert your secret data into some of the header bits, for instance, the ones that I marked here. And you can combine them, and in these you have to insert both your payload and your covert channel internal control protocol that can contain different header components split over different header bits. Now, um, and this is from 
I think my very first paper that I ever wrote and uh, together with my PhD advisor back then and I still I still think it's um, useful to explain this and I hope it helps you. I will not go into every detail here of this and the following paper. I just want to uh, highlight some key aspects but I, if you want to learn more about the details, have a look at the paper. So this is our network protocol that we want to ex um, exploit or that an attacker wants to exploit. And let us assume a covert channel could utilize an area of S packet. S stands for size. That's the size of the covert channel packet. So to say the, 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 the blue area is the size of the covert channel packet. The, the, the overall message size is size overall. And if we want to transfer um, this overall size and we have S packets per uh, bits available per packet, then obviously we need N uh, rounded up um, as overall divided by S packet packets um, to transfer the message. And if every packet would require an acknowledgement, the number would double. Now, a good approach would be, at least in the local area network, to exploit all layers of the TCP IP stack together. And then let's say we have lots of data in the IP header, not so much an IMAP uh, header and payload, but let us assume the combined area is this, then the S packet value increases. Of course, if um, we do not have a LAN and we have to pass multiple hops, then we cannot use this um, layer one. So we could only use uh, application transport and uh, internet layer. But anyway, we can still uh, benefit from having more data transferred. Now, if we go back to the idea of a protocol switching covert channel, the PHCC, remind, remember that was the one that splits the data over different protocols because it pops between the protocols. And let us assume we have protocols P1 to Pn. Then we can obviously calculate our average amount of data transferable per, per packet, uh, depending on the probability that we use to, to, to select um, some protocol I, um, where um, Pi is chosen with probability Pi and um, this is a, a big letter and this is a small letter. It's not so easy to see um, and uh, provides SI bits of covert storage per packet. Um, now we can optimize the protocol being covert channel for different purposes. In the quality of service sense, for instance, a password cracking program needs to transfer only a short password string out of a network, for instance, once an hour, an hour if a password is cracked. So one can keep a low profile and transfer only few packets um, uh, to, to minimize the overhead. But if you want to urgently, but still covertly leak videos of harmed protesters in a country with internet censorship, because you are a journalist or something like that, and you want to leak the data to the press, then you can still keep a low profile, but you want to transfer your data rather quickly. So you want to optimize for high throughput. And with, um, some very basic calculations, we can optimize such a channel for different purposes, for different quality of service um, goals. So if high throughput is required, we can maximize this function here. Um, obviously, one would in the end just choose the best protocol and um, um, not any other protocol. But um, and of course, we do this under the set of constraints that the sum equals one. Um, but um, this does not make sense because we want to use many protocols simultaneously. So we introduce a value M um, that is rather small um, and called the minimum threshold for selecting a protocol PI so that every protocol has at least a chance for selection. And that, in the end, still renders the forensic analysis more difficult because if one protocol gets detected, the other protocols might still remain undetected. We suggest to choose a low value M, for instance, C divided by N, 
with c smaller one and n uh, for, for for n um, equals 20 protocols and c uh, let's say 0 0.2 every protocol would be selected with at least one chance probability if the goal would on the other hand be to generate a little overhead and optimize the covertness this way we could first introduce the value qi where we which is um, the value of dividing the size provided uh, by the, um, uh, the size of the, the whole protocol header of protocol PI divided by the covert channel utilizable uh, uh, packet size, uh, which is S packet of the same protocol. Um, so in other words, QI tells us how many bits are transferred to send a single covert bit using the protocol PI. And now we can optimize function F2 again with a, a minimum threshold M. And uh, in the end, this allows us to have um, very little overhead. One could also optimize the stealthiness. Um, if each protocol or better each covert channel technique is assigned a, covertless, cover, a covertness level CI. For instance, protocols that might occur regularly in a given network are less of an anomaly than protocols that never occurred in the network before. So let's assume you see some BGP routing or something like that in your network, but you, you do not use BGP. Um, well, in your network, you anyway most likely won't use BGP, but an interior routing protocol, but um, that would be an anomaly. That would be interesting to investigate. So that wouldn't be much stealthy. Um, um, so we could optimize again a function F3 and um, try to optimize the covertness here. So it always works the same way. It's, it's not difficult and um, it can be done in an automatic fashion uh, also using a micro protocol. All right, so optimizing protocol utilization for protocol hopping covert channels is already nice to have. But can we also optimize the micro protocol itself so that we raise fewer attention when the micro protocol is transferred? Of course, the answer is yes, otherwise, I wouldn't ask this question. Um, we skipped the part on micro protocol size minim minimization using protocol engineering look up some of my papers if you're interested in that um, i discussed this uh, but i don't think it's so essential to be covered here but our goal now is to embed the micro protocol or covert channel internal control protocol which is the same in a low intention rising manner and this can be done um, with a tailored protocol engineering approach specifically designed for micro protocols i will cover this also um, rather briefly and without going into too much details if you want to know about all the details look it up in the paper um, but um, my goal here is to transfer the key idea so the systematic engineering approach for micro protocols works as follows uh, we start here at step one um, we have different layers. This is the underlying network protocol layer and this is the micro protocol layer. The underlying network protocol is the protocol that we exploit here. So this protocol that we exploit is the underlying network protocol. And this here would be the covert protocol. We first um, define the, the covert protocol inside the underlying network protocol. So that means we um, select the bits that we want to use in the underlying protocol. And um, then we evaluate the probability of these bits to occur, which generates us a list of these um, of probability values for each protocol bit that we exploit in our underlying protocol. So 
um, we have, let's say our protocol has a size of 1024 bits, the underlying protocol. Let's say it's an IP header or something like that. And we define 20 bits of this protocol as covert protocol. That's the bits that we want to exploit. Okay. And we look at the probability uh, of occurrence for these bits to be one and zero. And we store this just in this list. Step three, we design our covert channel internal control protocol or micro protocol. Um, and this protocol is designed independently for now, but it should have the same size as the covert protocol. And the output is a bit string, a header bit string. And we evaluate, for instance, by simulation or by guessing the probability of occurrence of these bits. And then we map both lists on each other so that we say, okay, the zero bit for, um, let's say, in our micro protocol that, that is used to say, okay, we want to establish a connection and the one bit that we use to uh, terminate a connection or something like that have the same probability like the, the value so-and-so or a similar probability like the, the bit so-and-so in the covert protocol. So we try to find the optimal mapping. And then we verify, oh yes, um, so here's a nice visualization. So we have the underlying protocol here. And um, we used the gray bits as covert protocol. And we mapped these three bits these gray three bits to the micro protocol. For instance, this is the acknowledgement bit, the data bit, and the disconnect bit, something like that. And um, let us assume this is the mapping. Here's also a dependence. So we can only set bit C if bit, bit B is set, something like that. And, and now we need to check whether our um, design actually works. This is the design verification step, and one needs to make sure that there is no under undesired bit combination set in the underlying protocol through the micro protocol operation. For instance, um, the micro protocol operation could set um, um, bit C without setting bit B, which wouldn't be allowed. And this would be an anomaly, and that would be easily uh, easy to detect. So this is what the protocol designer doesn't want to have. And the solution would be to model both protocols using a formal grammar, in this case of Komsky type 2, which is a regular or type 3, a context-free uh, language, and perform a language inclusion test to test compatibility. Um, that means the language of the micro protocol must be equal or a subset of the covert protocol's language. So this is one of the things, one of the ideas that I had during my PhD, and I will show you how it's done. I don't go into the, the details here of connection-oriented protocols and things like that. I assume you know what the formal language is. Uh, so we first define the rules of a COBOL protocol in a grammar, GCP, the grammar for the COBOL protocol, where we have um, our um, uh, typical formal grammar elements, so the, um, the vocabulary, vocabulary um, in the sense of terminals, non-terminals, production rules, and the starting symbol. And uh, next we define the formal grammar of the microprotocol, which is called grammar microprotocol. And we also perform a mapping of terminal symbols here. So um, we assume that um, in our set sigma, um, for instance, the bit of the cover protocol that has the value um, uh, the bit A with the value zero would be the, the non ac so the non-acknowledgement in our micro protocol, and if the bit is set to one, it could be the acknowledgement, some th things like that. So let us assume we have both grammars defined like this. So uh, we have the starting symbol here, ABC, and we have the um, 
um, the, the particular bits here and let's say we, from the starting symbol we can go to a b or a c and a as always a1 or a0 and so forth and for the micro protocol we have something similar this is how it looks in the end um, and finally we, finally we test using language inclusion to test whether the language of the micro protocol is a subset um, of the covert protocol. This can be done by hand uh, for small long languages or by optimized um, methods. All right, you can read this part on your own. It's just helping as an illustration, I think. And what if the language inclusion test fails? Well, in that case, our design was not optimal and we can modify the COVA protocol selection or the micro protocol design or the mapping. So this is where we have these dashed arrows here because we can go back, for instance, from the list mapping to steps one and three or from the list uh, from the protocol verification step to the list mapping or to the beginning where we define the COVA protocol or the micro protocol. Um, and when we need to model connection-oriented protocols, we can also do this. All right, enough uh, talk about micro protocols. I want to show you two more uh, of the sophisticated ideas. Um, did I say that network steganography can only be used to transfer secret data? Well, that was wrong. You can also use it to store secret data, at least for some time, usually at the time of some caching. Um, so introduced by Schmidbauer et al. Uh, the text below is copied from the paper. Uh, this can be done um, at least with a combination of the address resolution uh, protocol and the simple network management protocol ARP and SNMP as shown here on the right side. So the covert sender proposes uh, possesses some secret information and it wants to store the information in some network accessible ARP cache. Um, and the covert sender for this purpose exploits the ARP cache of a third party system by sending a fake ARP request containing a MAC IP tuple which, because this is stored in the ARP cache. The combination uh, as a relation of a MAC address to an IP address and the actual host reflected by this tuple does not exist but represents the secret information and um, the, the victim system or the cache system that is used to store the information is called the dead drop or D. So the covert sender wants to send the secret information here in the dead drops cache and the covert receiver wants to read it. Um, the third party host, so the dead drop, adds the tuple to its local ARP cache once it receives the information about this um, uh, new tuple. And this information can then be requested uh, by the covert receiver uh, for some time, depending on the lifetime of the ARP cache. And this is done using SNMP. And um, if you look at the lifetime of entries, then you can see that they depend on the um, uh, caching behavior of the particular operating system. So Linux hosts typically cache fewer data and when they, when some data, um, when too much data is stored or when some caching lifetime is reached, then um, all entries are dropped. Same for Windows 7 and Windows 10. We also tested some other systems, but here the number of cache entries is doubled. So it's 250 or 256 in comparison to 220 something. And um, as you can see here, if done nicely, you can slowly increase these values to some threshold and then they get deleted again. But um, the, the caching time can be rather long, multiple minutes. And finally, one idea, um, um, developed by colleagues. I contributed also a little bit to this paper and I like the idea. So reversible data hiding is not specific to the network. It's not new itself, but it's uh, you can also do it for the network as we have shown. 
So the core idea is to have a passive cover channel between the legitimate and uh, a user and the dist um, client and the destination. And um, as a man in the middle, you modify the traffic. This is what you already learned in chapter four. But the difference here is that the original appearance of the data as sent by the legitimate user is reconstructed either entirely or almost entirely. Because the covert receiver, when it receives the Stego data, extracts the Stego data and reconstructs the original state of the traffic so that the legitimate user does not receive any Stego content. There are three reversibility levels. First of all, fully reversible means that the secret sender can completely revert the altered fields to the original state. Fields means header fields. Quasi-reversible means it's not possible to precisely determine the original state of the carrier, hence the covertly communicating endpoints can only restore it in a statistical manner. Because you know, okay, this field's value is most likely um, 1001, for instance. There are also non-reversible um, uh, techniques where the covert receiver has no access to the proper knowledge required to restore the proper protocols data units um, or any network statistics uh, that describe the original state. How can this be realized? How can RDI in the network be realized? Well, first of all, intrinsically, that means the data hiding technique is constructed in such a way that the covert receiver can completely re completely restore the over traffic to its original form. For instance, um, um, it's implicitly clear how some some value should look like. The reserved bit of the IP header would always be uh, zero, for instance. Then, secondly, the explicitly a method. Uh, um, the covert sender also transmits the state, so it's like a covert in channel internal control protocol where part of um, the, the hidden data describes the original state of the over traffic before embedding the secret data, and then the secret data follows. Of course, this is a sacrifice of the available um, bandwidth and makes the covert channel slower, but um, it allows to reconstruct the state. Indeed, you have to compress the original state in some form. And then implicitly, the covert receiver restores the over traffic by removing the secret message and by guessing the potential original form of the over traffic before the steganographic modifications were applied. For instance, via um, estimations or past observations of legitimate traffic. All right, so because this was quite a lot of ideas now, I will summarize this, in this on this slide. Um, so we first learned about distributed hiding methods. Um, they make the limitation and prevention of network covert channels harder because we can split data over different, different protocols, use different hiding methods, different, well, different patterns and so forth. Uh, we can circumvent filters. Uh, also, especially with the NEL phase and dynamic overlay routing. However, if we want to do most of these things, we need some internal control protocol that um, signals between sender and receiver how, um, uh, how to proceed further. And um, for instance, how to um, perform some overlay routing decision based on transferred routing information and um, this can be optimized in several ways i i've shown you some of these ways and a few other mentionable sophisticated hiding techniques are dead drops for short and uh, and midterm data storage and network caches and reversible data hiding in the network where we can reconstruct original data from the covert data back to its original legitimate form or almost can reconstruct it depending on the on the reversibility level and the method applied all right that's all for this chapter